Thank you, BB. Um, it's very interesting to hear Brother Ong there, and I, I know you know a lot about the um, economic things, BB, with all your lecturing. And of course, I, I realize uh, I've been reading the prophets again a lot in the last <laughs> month or two. And <clears throat> what is remarkable, if you look carefully, that the particular thing that the Lord really remonstrates, he really comes through his prophetic words, through his prophets, he, he comes against the immorality, not necessarily sexual immorality, but the immorality in the realms of, uh, you know, that second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. And he comes against the fact that his people exploit one another the rich exploiting the poor, the injustice uh, that is taking place. And, um, you know, <clears throat> it, it's, it's something very serious. And uh, in Ezekiel, when the Lord through Ezekiel speaks against the terrible nature of sin, in the nation of Israel, of course, by now they're in Babylon, or some of them are. Um, and he mentions Sodom and Gomorrah, and he mentions nothing about uh, the um, homosexuality and lesbianism. What he mentions is their wealth, mm -hmm. their luxury, their abuse of the plenty that they had. Because of course, in those days, Sodom and Gomorrah was an incredibly fertile area. And so they were living in luxury. And that's what he remonstrates with them about and rebukes them soundly because they were abusing their neighbor and uh, not taking care of their neighbor. And so it's, it's good to sort of recognize that. You know, as I reflect upon what is happening, we realize, don't we, that um, indeed, there are things afoot of a serious nature in, in the world. There are things taking place from which there would be no reverse. And, you know, one of the impacts of that, you probably know that uh, what Disney has been producing for little children toys that it's producing to promote um, impurity. Um, you might know that, uh, oh dear, there's, there are things happening in the immor immoral realm, but there are things happening in this where the rich are getting richer, abusing the poor, profiting off them. And, you know, you understand that in the Old Testament, one of the things, the Lord holds off judgment. He sends his prophets. Jeremiah, one of the repetitive phrases in the uh, the, the, the King James Version is, the Lord says, I rose up early. I rose up early. I warned them. I warned them. I warned them. I warned them. 
And in the end, because there'd been no heeding, in the end, ripe for judgment. Now, bring that to bear upon the global state of affairs in the world. The, bring it to bear on the fact of the world, the global village. Understand that God is just. He warns part of the role of the church. You understand that in days to come, the church is going to become smaller. That may sound strange to you, but the church will undergo sifting. So think of this in the context of your church. The mixed multitude that is gathering in the churches will fade away into a compromised public church that will marry uh, other things. But the real church that has the real testimony of the Lord will become smaller. Another thing that will happen to that church, it will be much less uh, governed by, uh, shall I put it, heavy doctrine. It will be, it will still have the doctrine that accords with righteousness, but it will no longer be arguing about doctrine or presenting again and again, like I was in a church in the United States and I was not uh, uh, asked to preach that morning and sat listening. And the brother who took me to the meeting, he was surprised I even wanted to go. He said, all I hear is another lecture on justification by faith. That's all we hear every Sunday morning. The church will, the real church will more and more become spiritual, spiritual inward experience of God. Uh, some people would call it more mystical, spiritual, and it will all be much more to do with the reality, the inward reality of Jesus, the knowledge of God in Jesus Christ. It will be much more personal, uh, intimate, uh, the inward life of Christ and brothers and sisters in smaller groups gathered together like that, rejoicing in Jesus, loving one another, caring for one another, caring for their neighbor. This is the direction that things will go. Missionary work will diminish in its organized sense. It will not be permitted and things will move more and more to, to, to where the saints of God in villages, towns, localities, who really know how to care one another, uh, for one another, love one another, they will also love their neighbors. They will pray for the sick and they shall be healed. They shall pray for each other and things will happen. And they will be much, much more cast upon because the dependence on the world, the ways of the world that the church has inadvertently subtly fallen into, its methodologies and so on, the church will rediscover that which comes from above. That which comes from above very important that we grasp that this is what we are on the cusp of 
in the world. And so that brings us to, of course, John's Gospel again, chapter three. And John's Gospel, chapter three, where, of course, we have this rare statement of Jesus. I want to say that to you straight away that when Jesus uses the phrase born from above or born again, it means both. Uh, the Greek word anothen principally means from above. It is an exceedingly rare statement by the Lord Jesus that has been made commonplace by evangelicalism and cheapened in the process. The phrase born again has been made cheap, especially in American Christianity, but it certainly has come uh, in the UK as well and other quarters so that people will say, Oh, yeah, I got born again this and I got born again that and so on and so on and so on. It's rare. Jesus used it rarely. And he did so in chapter three, talking to a man who was, if you look in the third chapter of John, you know that he did mention it to this man named Nicodemus, a man. There was a man of the Pharisees, verse 1, named Nicodemus, a, a ruler of the Jews. We read something else about him, that he, if you look further down, Jesus says to him, verse 10, are you the master, the main teacher in Israel? The, the, the definite article, which is ho in Greek, is present there. So it's not a teacher. You're uh, the master, the main teacher in Israel, and you don't understand about what, the birth really is. You don't even know your history. <clears throat> because Nicodemus is, is an unusual man. We find him later in the scripture, don't we? Because he came to Jesus by night on this occasion, but came forth publicly you know, to take the body of Jesus. Do you remember that? Do you remember that he wasn't a night man all along? He became a day man. He, he became a man who identified with Jesus in his cross and in his burial and in you know, he came and took his body. He's an unusual man, Nicodemus, because his, his name is Greek, actually. Um, Nico, Nike, victory. Do you know, it's not by chance that Nike took that uh, swoosh thing. Uh, you know, it means victory. It comes from the Greek Nike. Nico, victory, demos, the people, victory of the people. Isn't that amazing that he had a great name? I, I find that incredible <clears throat> that he doesn't have a Jewish name. He, he has a, a Greek name and um, <clears throat> just little things like that. And he comes to Jesus by night. Now, we ought, to, we ought to really flow in our thinking from chapter 2 
So if you go to chapter 2 and verse 23, now when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover, now remember that, at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew what was in man. He knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. There was a man of the Pharisees. So we're talking about man, and you know that your Bible, you know nowadays, in order to remove, <clears throat> um, you know, the, the word man from the vocabulary, you know, we're, we're called humans, aren't we? But you know, when the Bible says he knew what was in man, he's talking about male, female, he's talking about humanity. Now everybody's called, we're the humans. But um, Jesus is here, he knew what was in man. And this precipitated, and they notice, he didn't commit to them. Their, their believing was superficial based on external things. <laughs> They'd seen some miracles. They realized that Jesus was extraordinary. And Nicodemus says, you're a teacher come from God because no one can do the miracles that you're doing. You know, that's what he says in chapter 3, verse 2. Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher. Come from God. Uh, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. And so they've got this estimate. Uh, he's a miracle worker. He's a teacher. He's come from God, as yet they don't know he's Messiah, that he's dealing in uh, another coin, if I can put it that way. He's, he's working uh, in a much deeper dimension than simply the healing of bodies. Does everybody understand that Jesus first came to fulfill the promises made to Israel in the Old Testament. And one of the promises was that the Lord God would be their healer. And the Lord Jesus, that's why he healed all who came to him. He was fulfilling the old covenant promises of God. I will be your healer, referring, of course, none of these diseases shall afflict you. And Jesus, the Messiah of Israel first, was fulfilling those things, those promises. But they didn't understand just who he was. And at this point, Jesus did not commit himself because he knew what was in man, that man's trouble was so deep and internal, so deep that the only remedy for man's great need would be a new birth from above. Now, <clears throat> you know, when I, when I read these things, of course, 
you notice that it's the Passover. It's the Passover time. And, uh, you know, Jesus in, I think we'll work it out, it will be one, two, three more Passover's time. He's going to die. The Lamb of God is going to die. And that locates you immediately, doesn't it, in the first Passover. Um, when a nation was born from slavery into liberty, physically. A nation was born in a day. And you say, well, what are you talking about? I'm taking you back to the original Passover that took place in Egypt. I'm taking you back there, and that is what seems to surprise Jesus about this man, Nicodemus. Uh, it's, he doesn't understand when Jesus talks about seeing the kingdom of God, you know, so at verse 3 of chapter 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom, the realm of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born of water, and spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Notice the difference. Uh, in verse 3, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And look at verse 5. He cannot enter the kingdom of God except a man be born of water and the spirit. And then Jesus says in the sixth verse, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So he's not, he's correcting Nicodemus's confusion. I'm not talking about a physical birth again. That's not what I'm talking about. Don't you understand, Nicodemus? I'm talking about spiritual birth, a, a profound uh, activity that uh, it comes from above, that comes right into the innermost of you, Nicodemus, and that changes what you are within. Marvel not, Jesus says, that I said to you, you must be born again. Don't be surprised, Nicodemus, don't you, don't you, don't you realize, O oh, teacher of Israel, that um, your need is very, very deep? You're a thinking man, Nicodemus. We're not talking externals here. You know, when I think of, um, you know, a lot of the psychology and 
you know, psychiatry. Uh, when I think of, um, you know, Marx and Freud and Nietzsche, see Nietzsche, he understood that the need of man was so deep. Freud, you know, tries to sort of work it out. He avoids talking about spirit. He talks about subconscious and all that, you know. And of course, Marx is simply wanted to present an idea that was all externals, wasn't it? It was all externals. Uh, he, he never understood the heart of man, that that's where the problems lie. The inwards, such a change, such an, a birth there in the inward man. And, you know, as Jesus is talking, to the man, Nicodemus, he says, you, you don't marvel at this, uh, Nicodemus, you, you, you surely understand that the, the needs of man are so deep, so deep in the spirit of man. As I say, Freud was busy avoiding uh, the idea of spirit spirit that uh, god is a spirit jesus is going to say in chapter four isn't he god is a spirit and he doesn't want your rituals outwardly he wants you to worship him in spirit with all the depths of what you are from the deepest part of you. He wants your love from there. Uh, you have an ache for that, of course. We were together, a few brothers last night. Um, and you know, as I was on that Zoom, and you know, I think there were, may have been 15 or 16 of us together. And I'm conscious of the great longing for communion and fellowship you know that goes from brother to brother and you feel that we all do and you must remember that's what god longs for from you he doesn't want your sacrifices and your offerings and your this isn't that. He, he wants the love of your spirit. He wants the communion of your inner man. But you know he can't have it uh, unless you're made clean uh, and you are born in that deep place of your being so that you by that birth are thoroughly renewed and changed and realigned so that he can have fellowship with you and you can worship him from the depths of you whether you are in sunshine or shadow sad times or good times where you know, from the depths of you. And of course, this is one of the things we who preach, there are lots of preachers and teachers and they preach from their minds, many of them, just in that dimension of the intellectual part of them. And there are some who get somewhat passionate with it and become emotional about it as well and hallelujah for that but there is a ministry that comes from God communicated into the depths of the spirit of a man and a woman and that man and that woman becomes someone who is is a 
speaking from the depths, from God. And uh, so their spirit is in it. And uh, you can hear this. And, but Jesus says to Nicodemus, you know, don't be surprised. Marvel not. Marvel not. Now, it is my conviction that many evade this. This deep calling unto deep, as the psalm puts it, that God is the deep who calls unto the deep of you and me because he wants the substance of what you are he doesn't want simply the external things and so uh, dear uh, the lord says to nicodemus in verse eight and he's taking him back the wind blows where it listeth, you know, and you hear the sound thereof, but you cannot tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, you know where Jesus is, don't you? He's talking to Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel, and you know, he's surprised that Nicodemus doesn't understand about this breath. You know the word wind and spirit and breath are all the same in the original language, both in Hebrew and in Greek wind now jesus is saying he's taking them back to the passover when that nation was born in a day their beginnings so go back in your thinking will you when did the wind blow when did the breeze come and they could not tell whence it came and whither it goes. And did that wind that blew when Moses stretched out his rod, did it make an opening like a womb? Did it make an opening? Did the waters break? Was there a wall of water to the left and to the right? Yes, there was. And through the sea, God made a way. He, he blew with his breath. And he blew and made a way. And so a nation was born in a day they came through i'm quoting that phrase born in a day from <laughs> isaiah 66 by the way and through the sea god made a way and the nation was born in a day by the wind that blew and they could not tell whence it came and whither it went Moses knew it came from God, came from God, he did it. And the spirit was doing that, that wind, that breath, that action of God. And he did it. And so that wind was right there in the tunnel. It's almost like, can you picture it? A kind of tunnel through and the wind was ceaselessly present and through and into the wind they went into the midst of the sea 
and they crossed on dry land. And then God said, now Moses, stretch out your, your, your rod again. And you remember, oh, it's, it was amazing, wasn't it? By this time, the enemy had gotten right there and the enemy was routed and drowned and finished in that birth there pharaoh and his host hallelujah the birth was not only giving life the birth was also meeting out death to the enemies this is the thing that jesus is don't you understand this you're the master in israel can you not understand this now you all appreciate, don't you, that this, that Jesus is saying these things at the Passover time. So we go back in our John's Gospel, and we go back into chapter one. And of course, we know that three days earlier, or several days, it was three days earlier, Notice the days. John talks about days, the third day, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, notice this kind of thing. Uh, the third day, of course, was the resurrection as far as Jesus was concerned. But it was the day when they crossed over Jordan in those that first time. The third day after what? Well, it was after they'd killed and eaten the lamb. So you shouldn't be surprised that in chapter one, on the first day, you find that John the Baptist is saying this. He's saying, isn't it wonderful, really? He's saying these words. You know them. Verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's the first day. That's the first day. Behold the Lamb of God. You see, everything in John's Gospel is built upon the history of what God had been doing in the Old Testament. Now, you tell me what happened. You all know it ever so well that they'd had to take a lamb for a household. A lamb for a household. Do you remember? They're in Egypt. Uh, they're shepherds, though they're slaves. They've got flocks. And they take a lamb for a, each household. And on that day, they slew the lamb. And hallelujah, they took of its blood under commandment given through Moses from God, and they put the blood on the doorway of the house. Lintel and doorposts. Lintel and doorposts. And they were in the house eating the lamb. And I'm going to read this out to you. It's the 12th chapter, of course, of Exodus. And it is very wonderful to remember that the word exodus means way out. Way out. It's the book of the way that they came out from the place of slavery. And I want to bring this home to us ever so strong and simple. A dear brother said to me, I must be more simple, I'm doing my best. 
you know, I want to bring this home. You know, the new birth is God begetting, bringing to birth his sons one at a time through the Lamb, through the Spirit. And in that process, he's making his claim, these are mine. And he slays the firstborn strength of our enemies, something you don't believe enough, I don't believe enough, that when God in Christ caused his lamb to be slain, and when he poured out the spirit on the day of Pentecost and birthed his church, that the devil lost all claim on you. You no longer need to be a slave. <clears throat> I need no longer be a slave. I need no longer be building Pharaoh's treasure house. Do you understand? It's, it's God begetting his family. It is one by one, God has no twins. He begot you by the Spirit. Jesus, you know, this is why Paul the Apostle says, he loved me and gave himself for me. One of the things I did this morning was read through the book of Galatians and just concentrating on Paul using I and me. And uh, he says a lot about himself in the first two chapters. He loved me and gave himself for me. And you know, God begot you. He begot you. And <clears throat> in due time you were birthed. You belong to him. Uh, and the enemies were slain. You know, first, the firstborn was slain that night when the angel of death. And so I'm in Exodus chapter 12, and I want to sort of bring this home as best I can to us. This is the type, this is the figure, this is the picture. Your lamb, verse five, chapter 12 of Exodus, shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, he shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up to the 14th day. But the whole assembly of the, church, of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper doorposts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, because they didn't have time to let bread rise. You see, they ate flat bread, matzos, and they ate it with bitter herbs, shall they eat it. Eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof, ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. That which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. You shall eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, you shall eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. And then he says, 
for I will, verse 12, pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite their gods. When it says the firstborn, it's the gods in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. Bless the Lord. New birth, this is a, a, a dramatic statement. You don't realize it, I don't realize it enough, but when the Lord came, he, that lamb died that blessed day that we call Good Friday. The gods were smitten by God. The gods, the gods that held sway over you, that terrorized you and me, slain that day, you know. And, you know, you cannot be free unless, and I cannot be free, it all begins with the fact that the lamb died. The blood was shed. The spirit couldn't have come at Pentecost. The church couldn't have been born. Peter couldn't have been born again. Peter was born again at Pentecost. John was born again at Pentecost because they embraced the lamb. They loved the lamb. The blood was shed for them. The blood was shed for you. The lamb, the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's why I took you to John 1. There's the lamb of God. Isn't it wonderful? He's announced. He takes away the sin of the world. And it says here in this type and figure in chapter 12 of Exodus, it says this day, uh, he said, verse 13, I beg your pardon, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not come upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. This day shall be a memorial day. You shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. And you go on a little bit further and you read this, that uh, <clears throat> it's tremendous really, uh, Look at verse 23. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. Now, do you see something a little bit different there? Something that is added. Apparently, there's a destroyer working. An angel of death. There's a destroyer. An agent of God. And do you know, notice what God said? that when I see the blood, I will identify with you and I will not suffer the destroyer to enter into you. I will not suffer, I will identify. Do you realize that there were Egyptian households a mixed multitude that they believed this word about 
the destroyer coming. And they would have identified with Israel, the true Jews, and they would have killed their lamb. And so when God, and they would have put the blood there as well. So there were Gentiles as well, Egyptians and half-breeds. And God would have identified with them that night as the angel of death, as the destroyers coming through, God sees the blood. And I almost can imagine it. It's God, with great delight, comes and identifies with enslaved man because they're in there in faith eating the lamb they the blood has been put by them in faith upon the doorposts and lintel and god comes and stands right there identified with that household and the angel of death passes by god identified you know this is what's so beautiful about those apostles who jesus called and those lovely women that followed him all the way through they were present when the lamb was crucified at calvary and the blood was on the lintel uh, of the cross and poured out upon the wood of the cross and they were identified with jesus they were there in faith amen and there was no mockery in them wonderment and amazement they didn't understand but they were identified with jesus and then in his resurrection that raised lamb came into their house their upper room the places where they were hidden told them things and then they identified with him on the day of pentecost those days later and you know how because they were made clean by the blood of the lamb through faith in the lamb the holy spirit was able to be present indwell the wind was able to blow where it listed acts chapter 2 and blow into that temple place where they were all waiting on the day of pentecost 120 of them blew from heaven into their hearts and they were born from above amen they were transformed, they were inwardly charged, invigorated, quickened from above, from above, life from above. There was no obstacle, nothing to prevent this happening. God was entirely justified in giving to these who loved the Lamb who believed in the cleansing blood and its power. Hallelujah. God was entirely justified in pouring the Spirit in and blowing upon them, stooping low uh, to these men and women of dust and breathing into their spiritual hearts the breath of his life. And they rose up a mighty army. Oh, Nicodemus, don't you understand this? Don't you remember it in the days of Ezekiel when he saw the vision of the dry bones? The dry bones. I don't know how many of you are thinking that maybe in our lifetime those dry bones in the valley of what they call Israel nowadays and their dry dry bones that one day many of them are going to see the lamb 
and his shed blood and how God is going to breathe into those dry bones. He's going to speak to them. They're going to come together bone to his bone. And there's going to be a move of God among those dry bones. You see, this is God. This is the truth. This is the Lord's way. I thank God for it. Do we understand? Do we understand? You know, you love the lamb. You love the lamb. You love his blood. His blood has made you clean. He's made you clean. He has the absolute right to pour his spirit into you, to abide in you forever. Jesus is going to, to expand on this later on in John's gospel. To do such a work in you that by the time you get to the fourth chapter, your inward parts are made so fresh, he'll change the figure and he'll talk about it like water. And he'll say that the life that he will pour into you as you drink will spring up in you unto life of an entirely different quality. It's a life from above. It's a life from above. You realize that the woman Mary, sorry, the woman Eve, Though she wasn't yet called Eve, she was just woman taken out of man, and together they make up man. You realize that a dreadful birth happened in the Garden of Eden, that a creature from beneath a creature who had been and was angelic, but now had become a beast, a dragon, that he had planted a seed in the inner man of Adam. Adam. And so in that act, we could say that Adam and his wife were born from beneath. Which is why uh, all the liberal-minded people, all the social do-gooders, including Marx and, uh, you know, trying to do good, to make everything even and equal and so on and so on, they are so misguided because they don't understand that man has something from beneath working in him that makes him a beast. <coughs> you know, I'm reading a book at the moment about Pol Pot and about what happened in those dreadful four years in Kampuchea, you know, the Democratic Republic of Kampuchea, you know, dreadful happenings. I'm reading about a place called S21, where thousands were tortured and killed and taken out to the killing fields. And uh, having made false confessions just to relieve themselves of their ongoing pain. And there's a museum there in Phnom Penh apparently quite a decrepit place, an S21, and people can go and see. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> terrible things that happen there. And then some of the tourists that see it, they write little notes and they say, yes, but the Americans have done it in Abu Ghraib. You know, if you know about that, uh, 
you know, torturing people. Yes, yes, the Nazis, Auschwitz, you know, terrible things. Now, you know, the British, you see, where's it come from? It comes from the inner states that came into us from beneath, that defiled the image of God in us that made us seek to quest after godlike status. And here is our blessed lamb who died to take that Adam man away. He became that man, finished that kind of species. And then, oh, it's blessed. Don't you love Jesus? Don't you love his blood? It's his blood, you know, <laughs> on your house. You know, his blood, you are the house of the Lord. His blood. His blood in your person has been sprinkled, sprinkled blood on the lintel of your house, your person. I'm talking about the person of your being. I'm talking about, you know, <laughs> made clean by his blood. I'm, I'm talking about you in your, as the temple of the Lord. And because of that, for me, it's many years ago, God could pour out his spirit <coughs> into me to abide in me, life from above. Life from above. And when he did that, he, he marked me his own. And I'm slowly waking up to the reality that all my enemies were slain that day. They were slain. All your enemies were slain. Those Israelites, once they got across the other side and the waters rushed back, the wind removed and all those enemies and their chariots were slain. God has done such a thing, my brothers and sisters. Such a thing. Such a thing. And we can have life surging up in us. That's why I say to you that, dear, the Lord Jesus said so wonderfully to the woman at the well, you... You drink of this life, life of the spirit, and it'll be in you springing up. That's chapter four. And he says, oh, my father's seeking. Your spirit will now be able to worship. You'll be able to worship God from your spirit. God seeketh such to worship him. Wonderful things, wonderful things. When I read these things, of course, I realize this. If you go back into John's Gospel, chapter two, um, you, you will find, sorry, chapter one, you'll find that Jesus is calling men. And of course, you have. Peter, uh, whose name is Simon, and how Jesus, it's, it's a remarkable series of events, you know, the, a remarkable series of events. But one of the things that Jesus says prophetically, when he sees Simon, so verse 41 of chapter 1, he first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, We've found the Messiah, 
which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. First conversation with Simon, which you know means hearing. You're going to be a new man. You're going to be a stone. You're going to be a new man. You're going to be not what you were. You're going to be new. Your name, Simon, means hearing. You're the, you're the son of, of Jonah, John. Grace. But you're going to be a stone. A some, you're going to be born again. Jesus doesn't use those terms, but you're going to be a new being. A stone. Solid, a building, a building, a living stone. Let these things come home into your heart. Verse 43, same chapter, chapter one, the day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth, Philip? said unto him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, and notice this very carefully, behold, an Israelite in whom there's no guile, no guile, nothing crooked, nothing deceitful, <clears throat> Nothing at all. He's a real Israelite. Can you tell me the first Israelite? Can you tell me his name? Of course you know it, don't you? You know his name was Jacob. An Israelite who was full of guile. A crooked fellow. Someone who stole this and stole that by subterfuge, influenced by his mother. She was like that herself. Oh no, Jesus says, now there's a new Israelite coming into being, a new prince with God in whom there's no guile. You see, everything here is to do with newness. Everything here is to do with deeps being changed. Everything here is to do with the inner man, birth from above. You know, I want to finally emphasize again, the above, the above, life from above. That's what comes into us. And our greatest need, of course, is the faith that understands the miracle of true new birth. You have power from on high. Do you remember that? You shall receive power. 
after that the Holy Spirit's come upon you. Power to be a new creature, a power to rise up and why ever, you know, Jesus, when he speaks to his apostles in chapter 14, 15, and 16 of this gospel, he just says to them, you know, you're, you're going to be people from heaven. You're going to know the power from on high. You, 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 you're just going to be different and you're going to be hated. So there you are. The miracle of, of new birth from above. And, uh, <clears throat> well, that's what the Lord's put on my heart to share with you. And, uh, you know, when you come through in the third chapter, you find again the image of the one high and lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness and those who look upon him you know those that look upon him saved from the disease that's working in them hallelujah saved from the disease the poison cleansed Hallelujah, blood, the blood of the lamb and the pouring out of the spirit. I hope it comes clear to us. With that, I'll finish. <laughs> Thank you, BB. Mm. Thank you, Brother Bernard. Mm. Would you like to lead us in prayer? Yes, yes, I will. Yes. We remember, Lord, how your apostle talked about you doing things that are above all that we could ask or think. Mm. I, I would long, Lord, that this word, oh, Lord, forgive us, the, the new birth, born again, <coughs> became like a little trite phrase in, in many quarters, many quarters. Lord, none of us were born into the world as a result of our own choice. Our first birth was not of our own making. Lord, it was the result of the acts of others. And none of us are born again, born from above, by our own decision. Mm -hmm. We are not born of our own making. We are the result of the action of others. Oh, Father, your choice, blessed Jesus, your, your life and your death, your bloodshed, blessed Spirit, you with great delight pouring into cleansed hearts, cleansed through faith in the blood of Jesus. We, we are born again, not of our own making, Lord, not of our own choosing, mm. though we do agree, but it's your work. Blessed Trinity, blessed Father, Oh, dear Lord Jesus, blessed spirit. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord. Lord, 
will this word come to us all in faith that we'll, we'll begin to see our enemies dead on the seashore? Yes. That we don't have to live subject to the, uh, the ways of the first birth. We do not need to continue in sin that grace may abound. Oh, any such nonsense like that. Lord, that we can, we can walk, Lord, and possess the land and live in the life. Oh, Lord. Amen. We look away to you now, dear Lord, and we do give you thanks. What a wonder. What a wonder. Mm. What a wonder it all is. Lord, Amen. thrill every heart, I pray here. May our hearts be kind of amazed. Well, it's much bigger than I thought. I didn't realize what you've done, Father. Uh, how you set your love on me, how you chose yeah. from before the foundation of the world that you determined to have me and do this miracle in me. And Father, I have felt and known something of this power quickening and rising up in me. Often I have felt it, Lord, and known it inwardly. I did not realize what you did for me when I was truly born from above and your spirit, your life came into me. I, I didn't realize. May something of this, Lord, dawn on us all much more, much more, much more. And may, like the woman at the well, oh, Lord, may we become those whose that living water springing up into, in us unto everlasting life, up, up because it comes from above and it enables us to live mm -hmm. to the glory of God in the earth. And then you said, Lord, in chapter seven, that it would flow out, 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 out of the innermost parts mm -hmm. would flow rivers of living water. This is what you said, Lord. This, this is what you said about the life in the spirit. Wonderful what you've done, Lord. And we give you thanks. Thank you. Yeah. We worship you. Amen. Oh, thank you. You're a spirit, Lord. And we must be so birthed in our spiritual man so that we are in the same spiritual abilities to fellowship with you, to worship. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Thank you for this. We, we're, we're glad. I'm glad, Lord. I praise you. Amen, Lord. Amen.